good to see you this morning. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel Heartland and thank you for joining us, joining in with us as we dive into God's Word this morning. We'll be finishing up Matthew chapter 6 and I would like to make mention in the way of announcements that next Sunday we'll have Pastor Sean Stone from Far Reaching Ministries uh, coming and speaking to us live. So there won't be a pre-recorded service, um, but I hope you will be able to make your way out and join with us. Uh, last week, as we looked at the first part of chapter 6, we were with Jesus as he examined and explained to us giving and prayer. Two things that we ought to do, and he explained what our attitude should be regarding prayer and giving in contrast to what the Pharisees and the scribes were doing in their day. And everyone looked to them as the spiritual leaders, and so for Jesus to come out and say these things was quite a, an eye-opening experience for these disciples. He was, Jesus was telling us that we should live as unto the Lord and not as unto men for their praise and approval. Jesus also mentioned forgiveness many times, and it was sort of a theme last Sunday as we took the Lord's Supper communion at the end of the service. Um, afterwards, last week, God revealed to me this simple way for us to look at our forgiveness and to examine our hearts. Um, and it begins by asking this question, who is it that continues to bring up our past sins and our past failures in our lives? Who is it? It's Satan. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 103 that when God has forgiven our sin, he has removed it as far as the east is from the west. So if you start traveling east, you will never get to the point where you are in the West. Unlike North and South, if you travel from the North to the South, you can end up in the South. Uh, and that's a blessing. Amen. <laughs> but this just shows us God's forgiveness. When He forgives us, He removes it completely. And He will never bring it up again. So if we say if, that we have forgiven someone, are we like Satan and we continue to bring that up, reminding people of what we say we have forgiven them for years afterwards? Or are we like God? When we tell someone we forgive them, we never bring it up again. That's heavy, I know, but it beat me up also. You know, as we examine our hearts, which is what Jesus is trying to get us to do through the Sermon on the Mount, he's trying to show us what our heart's intent are, and what they should be. So this morning, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and begin in verse 16, and we'll go all the way through to verse 34. So let's read this passage together, and see what else Jesus was trying to teach these disciples, and trying to teach us. Verse 16 says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and dust, moth and rust, dust can get in the way too, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye, therefore, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great or how big is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all the, after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that we can have it and hold it and study it. God, that it is alive, it is living. And Lord, the author, the Holy Spirit lives within us and he can guide us and direct us and teach us as we read your word. Lord, we thank you for every opportunity you give us. We thank you for everyone who hears your voice and calls and cries out to you and accepts you as their Lord and Savior. God, and I pray that today there would be one in our audience who would cry out to you and make today their day of salvation, that they would become a new creation in you. Lord, we just praise you for how you work. We praise you for how you have blessed Calvary Chapel Heartland. Lord, we just pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us and direct us. Help us to be humble. Show us, Lord, how to follow you. Teach us, Lord, how to live for you. And Lord, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verse 16, Jesus says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now Jesus talks on fasting. He talked about prayer. <clears throat> he talked about giving. Now he's speaking on fasting. And fasting is the complete abstinence of food while we are seeking the Lord. And in doing so, we are drawing near to him. And as you can imagine, it makes you weak when you don't have food. You know, we get that feeling that we're starving if we don't eat three meals a day. However, the hyper-spiritual people of Jesus' day, they love to put their suffering on display for all to see so that everyone would know they're fasting and would pat them on the back at their spirituality. But Jesus is saying, when he says they disfigure their faces, he's telling us that they make an extra effort to look sad and pitiful, to let people know they're fasting, to let people know they're suffering, to make people think, oh man, look how spiritual they are. They're fasting. Again, 
Jesus says those who do that or do those types of things for the praise of men, they'll have their reward. They'll get their pat on the back from men. But Jesus tells us that when we fast, we should fast in such a way that it's between us and God. That we should take care of ourselves. When he says anoint our heads with oil and to wash our face, he's saying just do what you normally do to look presentable when you go out in public. Other people shouldn't know that you are fasting. It shouldn't be your goal to let other people know that you're fasting. And Jesus again mentions a secret place that is a special relationship between us and God. A close, intimate fellowship, a close walk with God. This was an entirely foreign concept to these disciples that Jesus was teaching. God again says he will show himself openly and reward us in such a way if we only seek him personally and intimately. Now he's not saying that, you know, as we serve him in this way that there'll be a big check that shows up in our bank account. No, he's saying that he will bless us with spiritual gifts. Those things, the joy and the peace that we ask for. He will grant us those things as we serve him in an intimate way. Verse 19 continues, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust de destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So Jesus again is telling his disciples and telling us something that is quite the opposite of their culture, something that is quite the opposite of our culture. You see, it has been important for all generations for people to have to save and to have a nest egg and to try to provide for their families. Uh, and Jesus is revealing here that even when we do that, uh, those treasures are exposed to the earth and they're exposed to the destruction this world can provide. You see, moths in their day would eat their clothing and rust would attack anything that's made of metal. And thieves, thieves love to steal anything that has value. They want to take it. And Jesus is not saying that saving is a bad idea. He's saying that our faith in our own provision is futile. No matter how careful we are, it could vanish quickly, even instantly. And we would be left with nothing. And if our faith is in all our goods and it vanishes, where will we be? We've, we have witnessed that happening. People being locked out of their accounts because of their opinions and their outspoken opinions. And they spoke out against a certain narrative. That can happen in our electronic world that we live in. It can happen very quickly. So we should, not, we should know that our provision can vanish. And that our faith should not be in my ability to produce my provision. I hope that makes sense. Our focus should not be on my ability to make my provision. I should work to provide for my family. <clears throat> then Jesus goes on to tell us that we should lay up treasures in heaven. And those treasures would be eternally secure. They would never fade away. They would never rust. They would never be corrupted by this world. They would never vanish. Nobody's ever going to take those away from us. If our faith is in God and our treasure is in heaven, even if we lose everything on this earth, even if we lose our lives, those heavenly treasures that we laid up, they'll be waiting for us when we get to heaven. Remember Job? Remember all the troubles that he faced? Losing his family. Losing his livestock. He lost everything. And people antagonized him. But he was still able to say through it all, Though he slay me, yet... Will I trust him? He lost everything, but his faith was not in everything. 
His faith was in God. Pastor Chuck Smith says it this way, and if you've laid up your treasures upon earth, then your heart is going to be in the material things of this world. If you have laid up your treasures in heaven, then your heart's going to be in the things in heaven. Spiritual things. No one... One of these is temporal, and the other is eternal. And if you lay up your treasures on earth, they are at best temporal. If you lay up your treasure in heaven, they are eternal. Jesus is trying to get us to see, and these disciples, to examine our hearts in this way. He's not saying that we shouldn't work to take care of our families, provide for our future. He's saying, he's telling us not to be wholly focused on what we can provide and what the world can provide, but to be wholly focused on what he can provide, those things that are eternal. And one of the ways we, we put our treasure in heaven is to tell other people about Jesus Christ so that they will be there when we get there, that we will be a witness of what he has done in our lives so that we can see these people in the future when we get to heaven. And I'm looking forward to that day to see people that I knew who are believers and to be reunited with them. That will be a great day. And then in verse 22, he says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, or single in the King James Version, having that idea of a singular focus, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, or has evil intent, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great or how vast or how large is that darkness? Jesus is giving instruction on the use of the eye, but also on the use of our focus, what we are focused on. What is it that our eyes see? What is it that our eyes search for? What do we look for? Do they look for things of the light or spiritual things? Or do our eyes look for things of darkness or things of the world to gaze upon and to study? The eyes lead us just as the lamp leads us, just as our headlights lead us in the dark. We can see where we're going because of the light. And the light that comes into our eye shows us what's ahead. The King James Version uses single for good or single in purpose. And it has the idea that we are focused on God. We are focused on his purpose and not on the world. Not on the things of the world. It is a singleness of mind looking to Jesus Christ and how we can serve him. Jesus' instruction here tells the disciples and tells us that whatever our eyes take in, that's what fills our body, that's what fills our core, that's what fills our being and our hearts, whether we search for light or whether we search for darkness. What do we want to take into our body? The deceiver and the world want us to be distracted and to be tempted. They want to see us fail as a believer. They want you and I, to not be focused, not to be wholly focused on Jesus Christ, but to be distracted and divided among the many enticements and the confusion that this world has to offer. We have to focus our attention on the light of the world. That's Jesus. We have to seek out the light and not run from it so that the whole body, our whole being, is filled with his light. Amen. The verse 24 continues. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus adds that we cannot serve two masters, and we cannot live dividing in our hearts. And it's similar to the previous passage where we must remain focused. We must make a choice, we must make a decision, and we must remain focused, which takes effort on our part. If you've ever worked in a situation where you have more than one boss, you may have 
known from experience how difficult this can be because it often when you have more than one boss you, it gets very confusing and frustrating because they can give you entirely different instructions for what you're supposed to be doing or the tasks that you're supposed to be accomplishing and so it's not enjoyable or relaxing at all because you're torn between which one should I do and who should I listen to only where Jesus is teaching he's speaking of these two masters of our own choosing we can live with one foot in the world and one foot serving Christ we can try to do that to the best of our ability but will we have pleasure in that because a part of us that serves Christ knows that the, what we're doing on the other side is not right. And if we're living for the world on the other side, we look back at Christ and we say, well, if he wasn't in the picture, I could do what I wanted. Neither of these brings peace. Neither of these brings joy. Can we be sold out for Jesus Christ and still dabble in our sin and have pleasure in both? I say no. Will God bless that life? I say no. It will be frustrating and confusing as a believer in Jesus Christ to try to live both for Jesus Christ and enjoy all that the world has to offer. We have to make a choice. We have to choose which master we are going to serve. And then in verse 25 it says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? How many of us worry unnecessarily? Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't think about these things. He's not saying that at all. He is saying that we shouldn't be disabled by the fear and by worry in such a way that we are not productive at all, so that we are paralyzed. We're not going to get any taller if we're worried about how short we are. We're not going to add anything to ourselves by worry, is what Jesus is saying. And he asks us two specific questions that really examine our hearts. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Are you not of more value than they? It's so important that we realize that Jesus is going to provide for us, that we should not be so paralyzed by our fear and our worry that we can't function in this world. Now, as a side note, this is not what Jesus is saying, but I want to add this in because it's important to our world today. Worry can be disabling, but God is enabling and there are those who would teach that anxiety and worry are caused only by a lack of faith. And if we somehow had more faith, that our anxiety and our worry would go away. And this is usually taught by those who have ne never experienced anxiety or depression. Charles Haddon Spurgeon suffered from depression. You may or may not have known that. But do you think Charles Haddon Spurgeon had enough faith? I think he did. And don't understand, God can completely heal worry and anxiety and depression by either a miracle or by a doctor or by some counselor, just as other diseases and illnesses. But we should begin by inspecting our hearts first. What Jesus was teaching his disciples about here is not this type of condition, but the type of condition where we worry unnecessarily. The heart condition that we are consumed and anxious in thought and stressed out and worrying about what's going to happen next, about our food and our clothing, our provision. 
And the hardest part about anxiety and worry is that as we focus on anxiety and worry, they become worse. We can't fix worry by worrying more, can we? We can't fix anxiety by being more anxious, can we? But yet when we do, that's, what, that's the result. Jesus tells us a little secret. He tells us that we should be busy doing what God has created and gifted us to do. And in doing so, we occupy our minds so that we do not have a sole focus of worry regarding our food and clothing. That's what he talks about when the birds and his provision for those birds, they are active doing what he created them to do. And they are all busy about their lives. And they don't worry and stress about provision. God meets that need. This is a key to overcoming worry in your life. Focus on the word, on the work and the gifts that God has given you and be about the tasks of the day. Be busy doing God what God has made you to do. And here's a passage that has helped many. You may even want to write this down so that you have it or give it to someone else. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 19, it says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is just another key to overcome worry. When you're having a battle with worry, start singing. Start praising the Lord. Turn on the Christian music and praise the Lord. Turn on worship music. Praise the Lord. The devil hates these things and he will flee. And Jesus continues to teach on this very topic. Verse 28 says, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of field, how they grow. They neither spin nor toil, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, you might be thinking, is Jesus saying that we don't have to work? No. He's not saying that at all. Because 2 Thessalonians 3.10 tells us, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. That's the Apostle Paul explaining this condition that people thought they didn't have to work. Jesus is, though, he is showing us that he will provide. Even in the garden, that is grown to be consumed, indicated by the grass. He provides for the grass, even though it's going to be consumed. It's going to be baked in the oven and made into bread and consumed. He still provides for that grass. And Jesus, he does provide for us and his disciples. Then Jesus continues on to lead us in these next few verses. Verse 31, he says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows all that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. These are normal questions. What shall we wear? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? We all think about those things every day, right? But Jesus says this is beyond that. This is worrying, being consumed by those thoughts. The worry and distress caused with these questions. But verse 33 tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things that you're worrying about will be added unto you. He knows what we need before we even ask. He just said that. Don't worry about tomorrow. Focus, focus on the things of today. Work on the things that you have right in front of you. Seek God and his 
righteousness, and he will provide. Now verse 33 and verse 34 are special to me because it involves a period of my life where I had great anxiety and deep pain. Uh, and the very things that Jesus is teaching the disciples about in these verses, he used to heal the hurt in my life. You see, when I was young, when I was 16, my brother was killed in a helicopter crash. And for many nights afterward, I would have these dreams of him burning in a fire. And it was very real. And it lasted for a couple of weeks or so. And then Jesus used these verses. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things that you're worried about will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you can't change. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And he lifted a burden from my heart of what was going on in my life personally. Because I was consumed by the worry and the fear of what had happened to my brother. God knows our hurt. He knows our pain. And he wants to provide healing to us through his word, through his people. So in this small section of scripture that we've looked at today, Jesus is teaching the disciples and us that we should fast unto him. Not to show or not to please people around us. Just as he said about praying and giving, that all is unto the Lord not for the praise of men. Jesus has also shown us and the disciples that we should lay up treasure in heaven. That is spiritual treasure, which is eternal. And to trust him and not the treasures on the earth that we can provide for ourselves. Because our provision is not going to last forever. His provision will and he has shown the disciples and us that we cannot serve two masters. We can't be at peace if we're trying to live in the world and we're trying to live for Jesus. We have to choose. It is impossible to do that. Trying to do that will not bring joy. It will not bring peace. It will not bring the happiness we think it will. We must live in a single purpose and that purpose should be to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Jesus tells us and his disciples an incredible lesson on worry and anxiety, how to focus our minds on what he is providing and our worship of him. Remember, Jesus is giving instruction to these men. They were just common people. He is preparing them for the ministry of the entire world. He is preparing them and us to reach those people in our worlds by correcting our thoughts and correcting our hearts. And one last thing in this area of worry and anxiety and depression, uh, maybe you cannot get out of the struggle that you are in personally. Do not go it alone. There are many people around you, and even right here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, that would love to help you. We offer biblical counseling right here at Calvary Chapel Heartland. And if that's not for you, we know other counselors as well that can help. Also know that PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, doesn't just affect military people or first responders. Anyone who has struggled through emotional trauma can suffer from PTSD. And I know that's not the type of worry that Jesus was teaching about, but I know that in our world, it is a major, major cause of suicide. Please reach out. People who are on the outside are often unaware of your battle. And I want you to know that no one has to suffer in silence. And you can call our church office at 478-219-5558. And we would love to talk with you, to pray with you, to encourage you in the situation that you're in. <clears throat> I'm 
Don't suffer alone. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. God, we praise you for the incredible word that you have given us to teach us, to correct our thinking, to correct our hearts. Lord, that we could live for you the way that you desire us to live. And then when we do, Lord, you'll bless us openly with peace and joy. Lord, that we know that your amazing grace has covered our lives. Even though we don't deserve what you have done for us, Lord, you will live through us and shine your light to this lost and dying world. God, and I just pray that if there is someone out there who is struggling today, Lord, that is at the end of their rope, that has been battling this monster for years, God, we pray they would reach out. Lord, maybe not to us, maybe to their neighbor or their friends. God, that they wouldn't try to keep it covered up. God, we need each other. The body of Christ needs to act together. We can't act independently of each other. You wouldn't have called it a body if you wanted us to be independent. Lord, you want us to act together, to be in unison and to be in unity and to love one another. And as we do, Lord, you will bless and Lord, we're thankful for that. Lord, we're thankful that you can give us the peace and the joy that we need to make it through our days. Help us to be busy about what you've gifted us to do and what you've called us to do and not to sit back and just worry about things we can't control. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for all that you've done, all that you're yet to do right here at Calvary Chapel Heartland. Lord, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you as you go through your week. And we hope we'll see you back next week.